Um, <clears throat> just wanted to basically introduce myself again for those of you who don't know me. Um, like Krishna, doctor is what I use when I want to go to an expensive restaurant and I want to spend more time. So I would love to be, um, I just want to spend more money, I meant to say. So I would love to be called Krishna. Um, I've been in the field for 35 years. Um, and I love being in the field working with families, working with children. Um, personally, I have three kids. <clears throat> uh, those of you who do not know me, I have a child who's 27. Child was 27. Uh, child was 22. And my little baby's uh, 17. Every five years, my wife and I used to go out on a date. That's why we have five years apart. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with some premises before, or some principles before we start. And some of them are here. Uh, today we're going to talk about culturally sensitive assessment rather than culturally competent. And so we're going to look at the distinction and what it takes for us to be a little bit more culturally sensitive. Um, <clears throat> but before we start with that, I, there's four major principles that I believe that are important for us to discuss. And one of them is everywhere I go, there I am. So that means that, you know, I cannot take my personality and put it in the closet. I have to take my personality with me. It, even when I'm visiting the family who I'm trying to do an assessment to determine what are the services that this family needs. Um, <clears throat> another principle uh, is my experiences often affect my interpretation of concept, ideas, and information. When you came through that door, you didn't come by yourself. And this is something important to recognize. Um, you came with every experience that you had. Um, and those experiences, one of the ways in which we could identify those experiences is when we start identifying who am I? And you begin to identify as a woman, as a man, as a person with a specific sexual orientation, um, practicing a specific religion. Um, so all those experiences come with us everywhere we go. And those experiences is what help us develop a point of reference. Uh, that we use for interpreting new experiences. And this is well documented within the context of social learning theory, I mean, <clears throat> that which we learn when we come from that thing. Um, <clears throat> and then another thing based on that is transferences are not uncommon. When we are working with people, uh, it's not if they happen, it's when they happen. How do we address them? How do we reduce them? How do we try to prevent them from happening. But transferences are common in terms of transferences being projections, interpretations that we have based on previous experiences. So they could be called positive or negative. Um, my, my, my point of reference is recognizing them to see the, the type of effect that they may have as we work with the people. And finally, for now these, um, based on the first three, Everywhere we go there, I am, or everywhere I, I go there, I am. <clears throat> my experiences often affect my interpretation of information and transferences and that I come is that that led me to believe that a degree of awareness is important for us to, to engage in effective practice. Um, so, but before we start, you know, and I wanted to just share this, but just go around a little bit and maybe if you could share your name, that would be great. And what would you like to get out of this workshop? Um, I know that why you came. I mean, I know that you heard this. A handsome guy was teaching this, this workshop. I mean, I got to go see for myself. And so now you're here and it's, you're disappointed. Uh, so I understand that. <clears throat> um, but if you could just at least you know, help me understand what are some of the things that you wanted to get out of the workshop based on the, and even the, the, the title, Culturally Sensitive Assessment and Interviewing. So, sorry. My name is Rebecca. Um, I'm a children's service coordinator, and coming from the Grass Valley Unit to the Sacramento Unit, Grass Valley has very little cultural diversity. Where I am in Sacramento, I'm sure there will be much more. So I just would like to get, I'd like to be better at being culturally sensitive as I approach these new families and become so. more aware of what their needs are. So. 
I'm Lori, um, and I work with a very diverse culture um, with my clients, so I wanted to become a little more knowledgeable about the cultural aspects working with my family's concerns. My name is Julia, and I'm in children's here as well. Um, for me, just being able to um, enhance my senses of that sensitivity of cultures, um, as well as just learning how to be a better listener. Um, I feel like with culture comes all of these different elements, and so I feel like listening is a part of that. So just kind of figuring out how I can shape that to be a better service so culture. Hi, Jessica. I have a diverse, um, diverse family on my caseload. However, I still want to know more about being culturally sensitive towards all families. Excellent, excellent. Well, I, I call it culturally sensitive rather than culturally competent. It's because of the idea that when we believe we are culturally competent, there's a, pers there's a preconceived idea that I know something. And that often affects how I perform. Remember what I said before, my experiences often affect my interpretation. And my interpretation is not always correct. <clears throat> um, my interpretation is based on my ideas and my interpretation is based on my experiences. And what I want to look at is, as I'm servicing the families, what is the family's interpretation? What is the family's ideas? And how can we work together? How could these services be impacted? by the way that we connect. It is obviously, it's obvious that there are several areas that we try to assess in order to better serve our families. And this is some of them. Biophysical functioning, <clears throat> uh, cognitive emotional functioning, social and environmental functioning, among many others. Uh, so it's very obvious that we are looking at certain areas in order to see how can the services that we're providing better serve the families that we are about to work with? Um, based on this, <clears throat> I would like to ask a question. Um, when you think about culture, since we are looking at culturally sensitive um, in assessment and interview, what comes to mind? So what comes to mind when you think about culture? And there's no wrong, there's no wrong answer. Obviously, this is your interpretation. Does that make sense? There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's just what you what you perceive it as. So, when you think about culture, what comes to mind? Tradition. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Tradition. What else? History and beliefs. History and beliefs. And excellent. History and beliefs. Traditions. Food, language, I mean, those burritos, you know what I mean? And then we identify that food with some kind of culture, you know? Um, <clears throat> um, Thai food. So we identify the food with a culture. And oftentimes we believe that um, we believe that we know something about the culture based on the food, based on the beliefs that we have been exposed to, based on the tradition that we have observed. So culture basically is, is a, system of, a system of meaning com comprised by beliefs, values, knowledge, and learned practice. So basically, when we, look about, when we look at culture, we actually look at how people perceive experiences. How people perceive experiences based on beliefs, <coughs> based on values, based on knowledge that has been constructed, created, and based on learned practices, language, behavior. So when we're looking at culture, we're also looking at language. For instance, there's a difference between calling someone a disabled than someone who lives with a disability. Does that make sense? So language becomes important. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we, we, we do know when we look at culture is how do people behave and how that is contextual? So we do know that not every culture, um, not everyone within the context of that culture behaves the same way. So the importance of understanding the complexity of culture. And this is where culturally sensitive practice comes about. 
Um, research has shown, for instance, that just because we share cultural experience with our client, let's say ethnicity, that doesn't guarantee our effectiveness. So just because I'm a male and the client's a male, just because I'm, I'm a female and the client's a female, just because I come from a very similar ethnic background, it doesn't necessarily guarantee effectiveness. Now, research has shown, <clears throat> let me see if I put it here, that if we are able to listen, people very likely will trust. And if people trust, they will speak their truth. And if they speak the truth, we will develop some kind of intimacy. The client practitioner, client worker. So it's not about necessarily sharing the same background, but having an ability to be empathic with our clients, so that our client is that clients are able to perhaps understand that we are there for them. And that's the cultural sensitivity piece. Are we listening enough? Are we, how well are we listening? How authentically, receptively are we listening? So that we are allowing and encouraging truth to be shared, not just symptoms, so that there's <clears throat> that trust that can lead to truth. And from there, <clears throat> we can develop a degree of intimacy. Um, I know that this is, I'm not going to pop your bubble, but I know that you know that um, as you are assessing client, client is assessing you. That should not be a mystery. Um, you're probably assessing client and client are assessing you at the same time. So <clears throat> no wonder the importance, according to research, in order to be culturally sensitive, are we listening attentively? carefully, impeccably, so that the client can feel, okay, you are the one that I can trust, rather than, are you the one who's gonna take care of me, support me, help me, or hurt me? Because <clears throat> generally speaking, when you see a client, they have seen other people before they see you. And some of those experiences may have been hurtful, or some of those experiences may have been helpful. So we don't know, obviously. We don't know until we start engaging, developing rapport as we are assessing those four types of areas. So no wonder when we're looking at, <clears throat> going back for a moment, the importance of understanding that culture is a system of meaning that clients come in, client come in with, and we come with a system of meaning as well. And can those two be included? in compliance? Can they work together? Can we dance together? Questions coming. I feel like I'm sharing so much so far, so fast. And we're going to do some role playing um, soon in terms of looking at a um, modality that I wanted to share. But I'm trying to create first some baseline for us to look at the importance of cultural, <coughs> cultural sensitivity versus cultural competence. Um, question. When you think about cultural sensitive assessment, what comes to mind? And why is it, why is it important to practice? When I think of the situation, so um, I have a client uh, who, uh, their family is Chinese American, uh, but they very they much practice uh, you know, taking your shoes off for the winter. And even just with being my first encounter with the family, you know, I observed and I noticed that all of the shoes were in front of the door. So I instantly took my shoes off. And I mean, I don't know what type of relationship or effect that had on the client, but I noticed that the meeting was a little bit more smoother, or, you know, because I've, I've been communicating with them like via email or whatever, so I didn't really know until I actually was there. So, I think that is an example of cultural sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we have to observe, no, they follow. Um, there's a um, sociologist used the term cultural ethnocentrism to help us understand how oftentimes we 
we judge other culture based on our culture. And when we become ethnocentric, we try we oftentimes judge other cultures as less than <clears throat> based on the standards that we have in the context of our culture. But they also use another term and they call it cultural relativism, which means can we enter the culture with no judgment? Can we enter the culture with no rejection? Can we, I put my shoes in somebody else's, can I put my feet in somebody else's shoes without just simply to observe? Um, and so no wonder cultural sensitivity, uh, we need to be a, an observer, we need to observe. We need to be able to let, let, let ourselves, ourselves be led. Um, traditionally in, in in many traditions, when they hold hands, um, there's a the belief that oftentimes, uh, indigenous tradition, I'm talking about, that when you give your right hand to another person to put it under, and to put your left hand over, symbolic of, I don't want to be right, I want to be led, so that I can lead. I want to learn, so that I can teach. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, how much do we allow ourselves to be led by our client? That's part of the cultural sensitivity, rather than cultural um, competence, which we're going to discuss in a minute. But <clears throat> cultural sensitivity, um, um, the definition is simply an approach to prevent misunderstanding. Remember what I said before when we started the conversation? we tend to interpret based on our experiences. So how can we interpret based on clients' experiences? And that's where the practice of cultural sensitivity comes in. How can I make sure that the information that I have written down is not based just simply on my interpretation, but it has this <clears throat> reliability and validity that it seem to help us understand that it's based on clients' information and clients' interpretation. And we're going to talk about triangulation in terms of questions and uh, reaching saturation in terms of responses. But that's what cultural sensitivity is about. It's an assessment for us. It's, you know, cultural sensitive assessment is an approach to prevent misunderstanding of information based on interpretation of concept experiences which otherwise could lead to misdiagnosing and mistreatment. <clears throat> this is um, some of the, the, uh, the um, concepts that I, uh, I wanted to expose the, the group today in terms of some of the differences between cultural sensitivity and cultural competence from the perspective that I'm bringing. Obviously, this is not the absolute truth. This is a perspective. And so one of the, the the perspectives here is that cultural sensitivity assume no understanding regardless of previous experiences. Meaning, what that means is, just because I have worked with African American families, it doesn't make myself an expert. Just because I have to work with Latino families, I, I'm not an expert. I may have those experiences, but I may have experiences <clears throat> that have not prepared me for this current um, client that I'm going to be seeing. In other words, there's diversity within diversity that we may have not been exposed to. So cultural sensitivity takes that into consideration. The, the notion of just because I have previous experiences, I am not an expert. Just because I have previous experiences, those experiences may have never, may have not prepared me to this, what I will call divine appointment, new experience. Uh, another thing, so no wonder, <clears throat> because I'm not relying on previous experiences, then I'm not in comparison of clients. I don't have to compare clients. And in terms of, okay, this reminds me of the previous client or the client that I had in the past, because I'm not using that as a baseline. I'm trying to understand this client, for who this client is currently, but not based on the other one. So there's no need for comparison. There's only a need for exploration of who this client is. <clears throat> Which takes me to the third point. The focus is on allowing clients to reveal their perception, their truth, reality, 
and from that space exploring implications for awareness and possibility for transformation. So this client may be very different to other clients. And so therefore my focus is on this client, not in the 25 other clients that I have seen that may have shared similarities. Where when we look at cultural incompetence, there's certain assumptions that often <clears throat> could backfire if we are not um, paying attention. And it doesn't mean that we don't we not culture, we don't have a degree of understanding. And so I want to clarify that. That I'm not saying cultural competence is an illusion. I'm just saying that there's a difference between cultural competence and cultural sensitivity in terms of premises, how the lens are often used. Um, cultural competence is a preconceived notion of understanding based on previous experiences. Um, I have worked with Latino families, I have worked with Asian American families, I have worked with African, African American clients, so therefore I am, I have some understanding. And while that understanding may be good, once we start bringing that understanding as the baseline, we can engage in stereotypes. Does that make sense? We can engage in this notion of stereotypes and implicit biases that can, <clears throat> can one way or another affect our intervention or assessment of this climate. So because that's a tendency to use preconceived notions of understanding, there's a tendency to compare climates. It's a tendency to compare a plan. And therefore, if one is not careful, the effect of implicit biases, thinking this is how African American clients behave, this is how Latino clients behave, this is how Asian American clients behave, this is how Italian American clients behave. There's a tendency to have those implicit biases that will somehow blind us, have the potential to blind us into performing a certain way. <clears throat> so I'm giving this as a, as a baseline for us to, when we engage in a role play uh, soon, when we engage into what exactly is uh, culturally, culturally, sensitive, culturally driven sensitive practice, at least we have some ideas as to why this is being presented within the current literature. Um, <clears throat> in terms of looking at culturally sensitive. Another term that has been used is cultural humility. How to be humble within the context of cultural differences. Um, <clears throat> but two major areas to consider when we are looking at culturally sensitive practice is one, possible, possible implicit biases that we might come, come to bring with us based on previous experiences and identification of the strategies for addressing possible transferences based on those implicit biases. And for instance, um, just some self-disclosure. Um, I, um, I came here to California about 20 years ago. And I, as soon as I went to, um, I met, I had started meeting new, new friends, and one of the person, um, out of nowhere I said, hey, do you know how to make burritos? I didn't even know what burritos were to begin with. Um, so I was like, no, I don't know how to make burritos. I don't know. They were assuming that I was Mexican because I speak Spanish. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting one. Um, two, with, even within the context of Spanish-speaking families, Spanish-speaking communities, there's differences in terms of language. Um, there's differences in terms of language. As you probably know, um, there's terms that I use that mean something different. For instance, it's not uncommon for a child to be called papito or mamita, which simply means mother or father. Little mother, mamita, little, little father, papito. They're not, they're not looking at a child's parent. It's sweetness. What they basically, the term is about sweetness. It's not about <clears throat> mother, father. Um, there's some terms, for instance, and this one was, um, for me, even for me, it was an interesting one. In some um, 
um, um, Spanish-speaking country, there are some terms that means have different connotation and different interpretation. For instance, bicho. Bicho within, uh, within Mexican-American, Cuban-American is an insect. So I was, <clears throat> this is something that happens um, in one of my, my working with a group. I was working with a group and a client came, it was on Monday, we came together and the client was saying, you know, I went, I went shopping um, this weekend and then we went, we went camping, my wife and I, and un bicho me picó, an insect, bitten. <clears throat> you started noticing that the two Puerto Ricans began to move to the side, like, okay, what's wrong here? Well, for, for Puerto Ricans, the term bicho is dick. So imagine when this, um, this client was saying, it's the bicho me picó, the two Puerto Ricans was like, how can that happen? In their head, they were t thinking about the sexual organ of the man in a sense of, how can that happen? Especially when the client began to say, and he didn't just bite me, he bought my, bit my wife as well. Think about the implications in terms of language. If we don't recognize that one term can mean something different. <clears throat> and so no wonder the importance of understanding that when we, get, when we gain knowledge, in terms of culturally sensitive practice, when we gain knowledge, that's not the absolute knowledge. That's contextual knowledge. And oftentimes, we take that knowledge as the absolute. And so the moment we define something as the absolute, we are confined in the experience. The second area to consider is honoring culturally sensitivity or humility, <clears throat> cultural humility, while engaging the client's center approach. How can we be humble to the client's culture so that we are being taught rather than assuming that we understand? Questions coming. Do you think it's challenging to have a view culturally sensitive, especially if you're a part of that culture? I think it's very challenging, even if you're not part of the culture, because Several things. One is that we we often function according to patterns, so we get used to things, and oftentimes we, as I would say, as human, there's a tendency for us to 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 try the easy way out. So stereotypes. They said true thing is stereotypes. It came from somewhere. So they, that's what I mean. There's a truth. It's not the truth. It's just. Those behaviors have been observed. But when we generalize those behaviors is when we get into trouble because now we're not seeing the client. So the complexity is that obviously we tend to function in patterns. We also, you know, as a society, we tend to the easy way out. <clears throat> um, oftentimes the educational uh, system doesn't allow us to be thinkers but to consume knowledge. And that's one of my biggest criticisms of the educational system. We are giving knowledge to consume rather than presenting information for us to explore and elaborate and create. So we become puppets. Um, they, and, and this is what I call the difference between cultural influence and cultural choice. When, when do we engage in cultural choice? That's when we have, oftentimes, being able to think outside the box. And then from there we determine, oh, this is no longer working. And sometimes it happens at the individual level, sometimes it happens at the communal level, sometimes it happens at the cyber level. And that's what we probably could call counterculture, meaning cultures that recognize that they are not included within the dominant culture and therefore they, they strive for not just inclusion, for, but for modification of the status quo. And hopefully, I, and, and that, you know, making this a bit more complex than what it is, because simply said, um, <clears throat> we are constantly going through this notion of cultural influence based on what we perceive to be truth. Does that, make, that make sense? Like, let's define belief for a moment. <clears throat> what is a belief? Thought you're holding. You hold dear you. 
Okay. Thoughts that you hold there you, within yourself? What else? Something taught. Something taught? What else? Think about it for a moment. What is a belief? Because we all have beliefs, no? And when, we, when we're thinking about culture, we are basically thinking about beliefs. Values, assumptions, knowledge, learned practices, language, So, you know, going back to your question, it's a difficult yes. And if we start here as a baseline, not to deviate too much from what we're doing, but in to include some different content, if we start by the definition of belief, beliefs is a notion of truth. Yeah? <clears throat> so let's define belief as a notion of truth. Now, this notion of truth, often we, we perceive this as the absolute truth. Um, and so that's when we get into trouble, because we get into arguments. I'm right and you're wrong. This is the way of doing things, where in reality there's multiple ways of doing things. But we develop beliefs that then this becomes dominant culture. Can you see that? And from there we are being taught. Well, you answered my question. Um, that belief comes from one's culture. Mm -hmm. But um, you answered it. Yeah. I mean, think about this for a moment. You, you are all women here. What are some common beliefs that society have projected about women? If you are going to define women, how would you define women? Traditional. How a society? Caretakers. Caretakers. Yeah. So what about if you have a child and you say, you know, I'm not the best caretaker. My husband is. Would you be judged? Yes. Because we have not just developed the belief, we have infused the belief that you should be the one taking care of the kids and you're a better caretaker. So that's cultural influence, no? How we learn to believe that this is truth rather than there's some truth in that within context. Some women are just incredible caretakers and some women mean that. The same way as when we think about men. What if some of them cannot trust them, no? There's no good to men. And there's some truth in that. There's men that cannot be trusted, they're not trustworthy, and there's men who are, don't function or behave with integrity and impeccability. But it doesn't mean that all men are the same. So that's where we, we, we get into trouble as a society. We become too comfortable with the belief and we make it <clears throat> not just here an assumption or a principle, we make it the total truth. If we go back to what we are talking about, no wonder the difference between uh, cultural competence and cultural sensitivity. The belief in cultural competence seems to be, one of the beliefs is that because I have previous experiences, now I can be competent. But is that the absolute truth? No. Um, because I may have experience, wonderful experiences, but it has never not prepared me to this specific case, circumstances, family. So the idea of cultural competence in relationship to cultural sensitivity, which means engage, allow, kind to teach you, rather than assuming that you already are competent. So going back to beliefs, is it a notion of truth or do we make it the absolute truth? So that's the difference. Let's do this case for a moment. Um, <clears throat> let me see where we are. Um, what I would love to do, um, two things. Um, can somebody read the case? Can you read it? You received a referral from E-Center, Migrant Seasonal, Migrant Early Head Start, regarding a 20-month-old boy, Angel, who displays symptoms of autism spectrum disorders. Some of the symptoms exhibited are difficulty following simple commands, below age-appropriate expressive language skills, all time, at times non-responsive seems to tune others out, and usually long and severe temper tantrums, seems unable to engage and pretend play, etc. You schedule a home visit for an assessment, 
Once arriving at the house, you are met by Angel's parents, Jesus and Carmen, and siblings Giselle, five years old, and Julian, eight years old. Sorry, that's one more. Reading this case, <clears throat> now my question, the first question, what preconceived ideas may you already have based on this information? Thank you. So if we honest, as long as soon as we get information, we make assumptions. So low income family. Um, they have kind of religious names, so they might be a religious name. Yeah, so I might call him Jesus rather than Jesus. Huh? And he might not like that, because my name is Jesus, not Jesus. So we make another assumption. Okay, they may be religious. What else? Um, it says migrant season, so possibly there's one parent who's always working and another parent's at home, so it can't provide for all of the children at the same time. Excellent. So the point here is that we already make assumptions. And so it's important to understand that when we are engaging cultural sensitivity, just the understanding that there's assumptions is important. Now, how do we turn those assumptions into questions become part of the process of cultural sensitivity? assessment. How do I not just turn these beliefs or assumptions that come into this? Let me define belief in terms of assumptions. I mean, my interpretation of beliefs is not just the truth. My interpretation of assumption is the acceptance of those notions of truth. Okay? So this is not just the truth. But for me, assumptions mean assumptions for me means the acceptance of those notions of truth. So we do have beliefs where we get into trouble in terms of cultural competence and cultural sensitivity is whether when we tend take those assumptions and we make them as truth. Does that make sense? So if I know I'm going to have assumptions, levels of <coughs> Acceptance. Now, in order for me to navigate into cultural sensitivity, I have to put into question those assumptions. Is it real that <clears throat> um, you know they may be uneducated? Is it real that um, perhaps they are undocumented? Is it real that perhaps they they do not speak English? Is it real that perhaps they are not intelligent? So, so rather than you know then 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 denying, <clears throat> if we are truthful, and we can do it quietly, we don't have to publicize it. So wow, I have these assumptions, and my intention is, and remember before what I said, if we're going to get into cultural sensitivity, one of them is to identify possible implicit biases, and some of those implicit biases are already reflected by the assumptions that we're making. So this is the concept behind it. This is the concept behind it. <clears throat> how, how now should I address, how should I address this implicit biases, which by the way, we all have them. We can escape them. We don't have the absolute truth. But we needed level of truth and a level of control in order to function, no? So we already have that. To what degree and how severe and how deep and controllable they may be. Those are all the questions. So let's go here for a minute. How would you go about approaching this, this client? So uh, I would love to role play. Is that OK? We could try. So I need. Three of you. <laughs> I need for one to be the practitioner. And this is now for you to, to feel like I'm going to make a mistake. This is for us to explore possibilities in terms of, oh, this is how I could improve. This is how I could. And you might come here and you do it perfectly. And you know I'm, I'm going to have to take you to the next workshop to do the workshop with me. So, um, so I need a practitioner and two clients. Uh, um, I need Jesus and Carmen. Excellent, excellent. So, would you be the practitioner? Is that okay? 
So let's say that you this client was already admitted, yeah? And now you go into the client's home to attend to identify services. What are the services that best match this client? Which is basically what you you're gonna go there to do anyway because you're the client's already admitted. So you read this, this was taken care, um, already known that a client is eligible. Now you're just exploring a little bit more just to see how to go about providing services. And would you play uh, Jesus? Yeah. Would you play Carmen? Is that okay? And so be the worker, practitioner, then you come. So just be yourself, what I'm asking you. And this, I, I just want to make a disclaimer. We know that this is a rope line. And so in some ways, it's bogus. Because it's not real. We have people watching us and we go, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a mistake. Just be yourself. You know, one of the things that I have learned by being in this field for so long is that the more that I am myself, the more I enjoy my job. Because then I don't have to pretend. Remember, everywhere I go, there I am. And so all I need to know is that my interpret, my experiences, <coughs> as I mentioned, remember the principles? My experiences are affecting one way or another my interpretation. So I'm trying to address, you know, how can I um, minimize my experiences and be more client-centered? That's all I'm trying to do. Okay? So. So we have um, East Center. Um, so cases in front of parents. That yes. The and then Angel uh, is a child. Uh, he's 29 months. Uh, boy uh, with symptoms of autism. Okay. So just be yourself and just I'm here for support. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a very long process, so I just don't know where to start. All we're doing is just, you know, to, just to engage. We engage. Okay? Okay. And you see, I'm like close to you for more. It's like <laughs> frequent, you know, the, the vibration frequency. <laughs> So thank you for inviting me into your home, and I'm here to talk with you about Angel's needs and what we can do to assist you in getting those needs met or find out where we can go to, to as resources for any needs that we don't know how to address currently. So um, I guess if you want to start by telling me what your biggest concerns are for Angel at this time. He tends to have Years, not very open to his siblings, and um, he doesn't like to eat a lot of variety of foods, and so I constantly have to change what I'm cooking and make him something outside of what I'm already used to eating, and can't really look forward to do that. So, are there any resources to kind of help with that behavior? Can we talk about that determining first what those behaviors look like? Are they appropriate behaviors? Are they behaviors that you feel like you would be better at just having somebody help you manage those behaviors, help you change the behavior or change the behavior to something you feel more is it's more appropriate. Mm -hmm. So what what do those behaviors look like? We notice that when I cook a traditional food like rice or beans, he doesn't care about the texture. He tends to like, spit it out. But he'll eat like, the tortillas or bread or anything with bread. All my favorite things too, yes. so I can understand that. <laughs> and I know if I understand it's very difficult, you have to create an entire for other people, and so you know, this, we have other children, and sometimes that becomes a, a bone of contention with them as well, because, well, he doesn't have to eat it, but why do I have to eat it? Let's stop you for a minute. You are so beautiful. I mean, um, I, should, I should pay you to come with me and help us. Um, so tell me, how did it feel? Like, 
for you? How is this experience? It feels normal. I mean, okay. this is what we do. Okay. <laughs> you know, and these are stories that I've, well, I shouldn't say stories. These are experiences that I've heard mm -hmm. many times. Okay, great. And so, how was it for you? And how was it for you, Jesus? <laughs> I kind of felt like Jesus was kind of left out of the discussion. <laughs> Okay. Right, right, and that's sometimes what I think my preconceived notion is, is mom is the one that's going to be the go-to person, the one to call, the one to, but it's not always the case. And this is why I wanted to just do this for a moment. We do have preconceived ideas. Mm -hmm. So imagine if we are, um, we're going to talk about self-regulation later in terms of what, is, what are some of my preconceived ideas based on what I've read? And oftentimes, you know, maybe, me not that you know, this is a Latinx uh, family. Mom is responsible, dad is probably the worker. And so, and not to say that perhaps there's no truth in that, but if we don't explore that, and, and we may assume that, we may miss, out on an opportunity. miss the opportunity of what he has to offer. Mm -hmm. And not just for, for us as practitioner, as worker, but for mom as well. And for dad and building that confidence. Exactly, exactly. So do you see that this is common? This is n nothing new. We do make assumptions. Now, what could you have done differently? Could have... After getting information from mom, kind of address that, and how do you feel? What are your concerns? Are they the same? Do you have different concerns? Mm -hmm. Language skills. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. So think about this for a moment. <clears throat> this is a brief framework. It's, it's important for us to understand that we become the structure of any interview. We have questions that we want to ask. We have a theoretic framework. We have the skills. So how they behave in some ways is relevant. How we show up and try to bring us together becomes the name of the game, if you want to call it. Okay? How can I be skillful enough to respect them enough to engage them enough? Because remember, if they feel listened to, what will happen? Trust. They trust, truth, they truth, intimacy. So if we have that as part of our structure, you know, part of the, the theoretical framework that we have is that, okay, structure. How can I speak in a way that they feel seen, that they feel that this is a habit? You know? And so now I'm practicing more than, they, than the assumptions that are based on preconceived ideas, often related to culturally competent. I'm going through this with very little to know, um, um, not that, that, that I don't have any assumptions, but with the, the framework, and part of the framework is to make, turning my assumptions into questions. Okay, so I more have a tendency to think that mom is the one who responds. Let me ask open-ended questions and see who's the first one to, to engage. Can you see that? Yeah. So let me ask the questions. And then I, I could start there. So if mom starts, so rather than approaching mom, assuming that dad, you know, it's like, stay there, dad. Um, what else can we have done differently? And this is, again, not, not that something was done wrong because she was very responsive. And I'm sure that if, if I would have allowed more time, you would have gone to Jesus. What do you think, you know? But what can we have done? For instance, one of the things that I find useful, regardless of the family, I always, from the beginning, make sure that I, I do two, two things. One, I, I always bring a notebook and a pencil, and I, I always make sure that they know, hey, um, I'm going to be taking some notes, um, so that that way, if you're saying something, I don't want to interrupt you. Um, that way, I don't, I don't forget. And by the way, anything that I write here, you, you have the right to see. Because legally, you have the right to see. Really, you have to, the right to see the file. So that way, 
I'm trying to just say, hey, I'm trying to learn from you. And another thing that I often do is, you will be asking heavy duty questions at one point or another. So, so it doesn't feel like a, how disrespectful can, I mean, you're being disrespectful by asking me that kind of question. I may say, you know, there, there's times, and I will let you know ahead of time, one of those questions may come and it creates discomfort. Um, it's, you know, um, it asks for very intimate information. And the reason for asking that question, or those questions, is for me to really know how, how you know, this service is the best, um, <clears throat> that are best for, um, you know, addressing angels' needs. So there's a mystery into why we're yeah. asking this level of so question. So the elephant, there's an elephant, let's, let's acknowledge the elephant uh, from the beginning. So I'd like to do that because one is that I have, you know, as a practitioner, I have two jobs. One is to, I know that there is a criteria that I need to, that they need to meet the services. And the other one is that I have a need to understand their experiences so there's a good match. That's what I call cultural sensitive practice. There's a good match between Good assessment leads to good interventions. Um, assessment that is um, um, fragmented, palliative, lead to that kind of intervention. So I know that one thing that I do know is that I, I am the structure. So I have to, in one way or another, not based on assumption, using my assumptions to develop questions. Using my, my previous experiences, like I said about cultural competence, not as a way of saying I know that I could be effective or I am effective or let me just take it for granted, but I can still use that as a way of preparing. Like, okay, so this is a Latino family, um, Hispanic family. What exactly that means, Hispanic, Latino? Because they may not even call themselves Hispanic or Latino. Does that make sense? They may call themselves Mexican American or Puerto Rican or whatever it may be. But at least that gives me an understanding of where I am and how careful I need to be within the context of the structure. Also, the theoretical frameworks. What theoretical frameworks am I using to intentionally assess this client or clients? Because now I understand that they're going to bring content, information. Together, between the structure, the content, and the context in which this is happening, the living room, the office, we are creating process together. So I'm assessing them. They are assessing me. They are asking questions. Can I, can I make sure that they understand the information that I that's one of the things I know I've done in some meetings. It's usually more of a school type of meeting because we sit more on the outside of that. But reminding families that we use a lot of abbreviations and they slip out. So please, if you don't understand an abbreviation or a, some jargon that we use, let me know. I want to explain it to you so that you're comfortable with it. There you go. So those, those are good things to you know, use it as part of the structure. I know that not every family may understand the language. I know that some family may feel uncomfortable with intimate questions. And that even helped me to also recognize that, you know, if I need an interpreter, it's not going to be the child. Because family may not be very willing to be intimate because of the structure of the family. Does that make sense? So the assumptions are not a bad thing when we don't put them into question and we use them as a baseline of possibilities. That's when things may happen. And again, you know, if you think about an assessment, what is an assessment? We just simply try to gather information to best serve the client. And so in simply gathering information to best serve the client, we want to be as client-centered as possible. Not based on previous experiences, not based on what I previously know. Obviously, 
what I know is what I know, and what I don't know, I don't know. So there's things that I don't know that I don't know. And so it's not about being perfect, but being intentional. Can you see that? Now, let me, let me, <clears throat> let me, let me ask you this. Think about these questions for a moment. Because <clears throat> I, I find them useful when I engage in, in um, culturally sensitive practice. Oftentimes when I ask a question, I try to pause because I want to give a space. And the reason why I want to give a space and I wanted to see how well I'm listening is because I might want to ask myself, what is being communicated based on the question that I ask? For instance, let's say mom said, well, you know, the teacher, t you know, I don't know, you know, I know the diagnosis, but there's some things that I still have questions about. Um, um, the teacher said that he doesn't engage in pretending play. We might be assuming that th this is the night of the, this, this is part of the diagnosis, but could it be that that was because he was not interested? For instance, let me, let me, let me take you to this. <clears throat> we do know that when we are assessing a, a, a child or family, we are basically looking at different things. Yeah. One moment in time. And perhaps we're looking at, you know, if we're looking at the child, we're looking at uh, strength, interests, and need. Why is that important? It's very important because we know that if the child doesn't have an interest, the child may not pay attention. And if the child doesn't pay attention, the child may not retain the information, which showing very important. And if the child doesn't retain information, the child may not reproduce what is being what the child has been taught. So no wonder of the importance of understanding, you know, how am I asking the question? Can I leave enough space for the for the client, mother, father, grandmother? to share, and then my question becomes, what is being shared? Is this <clears throat> a concern? Is this confusion? Because if she's still confused, they may not participate fully in the services. Does that make sense? So we are doing like a second assessment in some way or form that is not necessarily to admission. The client may have been admitted. But it's one thing is to be admitted, and the other one is to be maintained, to go through the services, not to withdraw. Another question that we may ask is, who is <clears throat> how is it being communicated? What is the emotion behind it? Is it fear? Is it anger? It's a regurgitation of information. Thank you. There's no emotion or thought behind it. Yeah. Uh, so if I start looking at that, then I'm, I'm more focus on this family than the previous five, ten different families that I've seen. So you see that difference between cultural sensitivity. Can I remain centered? Can I remain focused? Can I remain intentional? Can I remain present? It comes down to, to that. Can I remain present? Because now this becomes a, <clears throat> for me this is one of the most important questions of this. Who is communicating? Is it really the mom, or is it my interpretation of what mom is saying? And now I think that mom, that was mom communicating. Can you see that? Because it may be that mom said something, I made an interpretation, and now I'm thinking that that was what mom said. But I never checked back with mom. I assume. Can you see that? I assume that mom said that, and therefore, that's how I write it. I assume that's what she meant when she said it. Exactly. So we go back to assumptions, remember? Turning assumptions into questions. So I find that at least these three questions are important um, in terms of practicing being present when I'm doing an assessment of client. What is being communicated? What is the content? How is it being communicated? The emotions behind it or lack of? And who is communicating it? The observed, 
or the observer, me, the practitioner. Let's take a break. Five minutes. Any questions that you may have that could help us to engage in more conversation? I just more of a comment. Mm -hmm. I know that we're talking culturally, but I think that we tend to do the same assumptions based on disability. So, yes. you know, just the fact that this child has autism, I'm often catching myself saying, well, I've had other clients that have that have this, and, you know, in really referring mm -hmm. to other clients, but that isn't really helping in the assessment process. Yes. That's more me talking and not listening. And especially when parents, for, parents for the most part are not going to care about the other mm -hmm. clients. Um, so I sometimes have, they appreciate sometimes they, knowing that yes. theirs is not the only child that does yes. those things. Um, yes, you're right, you're right. Um, one of the things that I have seen, I have my nephew, I have a nephew who's 23, who has severe autism. Uh, he's acting probably at an age, age 9, 10 right now. Um, but my, sis my sister will be one of those parents who said, I really don't care as long as you tell me how we're going to work with my child. I have a niece who also, her daughter is autistic and she's about three years old. And she's more of the parent who, can I know what other parents are doing? So it's an interesting one that, you know, um, our assumptions, and that's what I keep emphasizing, our assumptions are not good or bad. They become problematic when we don't put them into questions. I mean, you, you're making a, a really excellent point. We make assumptions even about any kind of diagnosis in terms of thinking that kids will behave the same way, not recognizing that economics has an effect, police system, you know, how family function, tradition, as you were saying, um, <clears throat> will have an impact as to how the child is allowed to behave in cer certain areas or is encouraged to behave. Um, and so the notion of how do we become culturally sensitive or practice cultural humility in terms of this is this family, this is this child. And all those practices that we have had and all those experiences are wonderful, and yet they don't mean much when this, if this family cannot be served in the way that we know how we can provide services. Let me, let me emphasize, one of the things that I have noticed is that we have multiple ways of enhancing culturally sensitive practice. But we need, one of the, the, the ways that I find that is important is by recognizing the type of questions that we ask. Every assessment is based on questions. And then we also have you know, some techniques like paraphrasing. You know? um, um, <clears throat> summarizing. But most of our assessment, you know, gathering of, of information is based on questions. But I'm not quite sure that we often time sit back to reflect what type of questions are we asking. Besides the opening the question and the, the questions related to what we were talking about before, <clears throat> which is, um, sorry, the areas in which we want to explore. So these are some of the areas that oftentimes we try to explore. Biophysical, functioning, cognitive, emotional, functioning, social, emotional, um, <clears throat> and environmental function, or functioning. Now, I find it useful when I, I come, like I mentioned before, we are the structure. Yeah? When I come into the, the room, with an idea of type of questions that I want to use. And for me, I developed this um, the framework that I call four types of questions. So the station question, clarification question, self-reflection question, solution for, solution for uh, questions. And I find it that I can use any theoretical framework and I apply those questions too. Remember, it's not about, <clears throat> it's not about having a framework because regardless of how much you try, you will never be able to understand the culture. 
regardless of how hard we try, we will never be able to dive into every tradition language. But imagine if we had something that is sensitive enough in which we could engage our client. And that's why the notion of culturally sensitive. How can we be culturally sensitive enough in our assessment that could allow us to engage our client? So from that perspective, I found these two, um, four types of questions useful. So for instance, <clears throat> we always begin by soliciting information. Huh? So one of the you know, culturally sensitive is how can I remain client-centered is by asking client, help me understand. And not in that sense of help me understand, but can you elaborate on what have been some of the observations of Angel, missing Angel again as a baseline? Can you tell me some of the behavior that seems to be very consistent when Angel is with all the kids? How many words have you, you know, heard Angel since since we do know that some of the the background that we know is based on expressive language, behavior, tantrum. So we ask solicitation questions for a family to help us understand, better understand the context, the frequency, the duration of that of those um, experiences. Now, oftentimes, this is where we, oftentimes I find that where we need the most help is that then who is communicating? Remember that question? Is it the observer or is it the observed? Is it the family or is it the practitioner or the worker? What is being written down? Is it really the interpretation of the information, the information directly as you know, as clear as possible that came from the client? Or is it just my interpretation? So in doing, <coughs> in doing this, solicitation question, I don't know if you have heard the term triangulation. But triangulation is how can I ask the same question in multiple ways? The purpose of triangulation, asking the same question in multiple ways, is to reach saturation. Saturation means, regardless of how that question, how many questions, how many times that same concept is being explored, the end results are the same one. So now it's not just my interpretation. Now there's some consistency. Can you see that? Now there's some consistency. So and no wonder I, I rely a lot on, you know, in this frame, framework, I rely a lot on solicitation questions in which I, I try to, to ask the same question, not at the same time, obviously, because it makes it obvious, but at a different time, can I revisit that by adding clarification question? Can I revisit back that area? So I don't just ask, can you help me understand? I, I consume that, and I say consume that information. Um, I bring it back into myself with the intention of asking clarification question. So that that way is not my interpretation, but as the, the client is clarifying, the client is, is also elaborating. So that's another form of solicitation question, is as, the client, as I'm clarifying, the client is elaborating, as I'm asking for a clarification question, the client is elaborating. Now, what I'm looking for, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> what I'm looking for is for how many times asking that question, you know, this is a concept, so it's the same concept. I'm asking the question so many different ways, and at one point or another, is so trapped into a theme. And every time I ask a question, it goes back to the same. That's what I call saturation. Now, it's no longer my interpretation. Alone. Obviously, I am a student interpreting, but it's no longer my interpretation alone. The client has been consistent enough to provide the same response. Now, that's worth considering.
because now it's like I have a little bit more of a baseline that is not just based on my assumptions, but it's based on a consistent, repetitive pattern of answering. I mean, this is not just for, this is something that I use with my relationship with my spouse. You know how sometimes we take our spouses for granted, our kids for granted, um, our friends for granted. So this is just practice. I, I, I am a firm believer that what we do is not a profession. It's a way of life. So imagine, imagine everywhere we go, if we understand that my experiences everywhere I go are affecting my interpretation, then I show up <clears throat> in a more conscious way. And so then my job becomes a, an adventure. Then my job becomes an adventure. So that's why I find, you know, this question, there's four types of questions. Solicitation, clarification, self-reflection is another way of asking for elaboration. Beside the fact that now that now you begin to, sh to see whether there's resistance, whether there's confusion, with these other um, occurrences that may affect participation. You know, if I ask Carmen, and then I go to Jesus, and there's congruence, I, you know, after engaging in this pattern, then, you know, there's a solid baseline. Assessment is a baseline. If there's no congruence, it's something that I still have to explore in order to enhance participation from the parents. Because think about this. We can do the best assessment, but if the parents are not engaged, it was just the best assessment that it was a waste of time. I mean, it's, it's as clear as that. So no wonder we have this, this, you know, within the context of what we do, we have this system that is providing services, and we have you know, we call it triangulation. So we have these parents, or these parents, we can put the parents up, we can put the, the services up, and we are here in the middle trying to link. That's the job that we do. So how do we link? Well, well how effective we are linking these two is how well do we assess. So no wonder <coughs> clarification so this solicitation, clarification, self-reflection, uh, searching for a solution. Obviously, we don't do that alone. Those are the types of questions. And no wonder we have all the techniques such as um, <clears throat> um, paraphrasing. I often try to paraphrase in order to see if client, like, so this is what I hear you say. This is what you're intending to say. So I use paraphrasing together with clarification questions. Um, <clears throat> I often kind of use, some, I summarize to ask for more solicitation. So this is where we seem to be. Um, please help me understand. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Now can I ask you another question? And when I summarize, that becomes an opportunity for me to ask a question that perhaps is one of those heavy duty questions. Now that I have summarized this, this is a question that may be a little bit, you know, requiring for you to, uh, to share more intimate information, and I present the question so that I can be respectful. And again, you know, the purpose of this question is, um, <clears throat> so have you, you know, can, can you see that? Can you see the, the, um, the usefulness or, or lack of usefulness? Questions come. Sometimes I think it's just for two, because sometimes the parents are not on the same page about, you know, mom thinks that this is definitely an <coughs> autism diagnosis because of these behaviors, and dad thinks, well, but that he's just a boy. That's what, and so sometimes that really affects treatment. So trying to help determine how to get them on the same page yes. and help us figure out where to go next. Yes, and I, I was just going to get into that. This is what I use for when this disagreement. When there's disagreement, that creates discomfort. No, for me too, because now I'm in a in a contradiction, um, conflict, whatever it may be, and I'm I'm already part of the equation. I cannot just say, "Hey, discuss that." I'm going home. 
I'll see you tomorrow. Because I'm here to do that assessment and to see how we can work together. So one thing that I found that useful was how do I remain focused, consistent. And for me, in terms of how remaining focused also means can I be in touch with what is going on inside of me? Stand up for a moment. <coughs> So I'm going to ask you to do an exercise that is a little bit uncomfortable. Come on. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So think about this for a moment. <clears throat> I took a shower this morning, so I just know. Come over here. It's okay. Come over here next to me. So what I'm going to ask you for a moment, we have uh, six people. We're going to just walk for a moment. And we're going to look at each other's eyes. And what I want you to do is to consider what thoughts are going into your head and what sensations are going through your body. Because this will happen often time when we are in a family in which there's conflict, disagreements, and now we are in the middle of this event. I'm a firm believer, I'm a firm believer that we are in the right place at the right time. That is not by coincidence. And ultimately, if I believe that, I also have to believe that <clears throat> whatever skills I have were brought to this context for me to support that process. Now, in order to do that, I need to understand how do I address when there is discomfort? What is my tendency? So we're gonna do a brief exercise that is uncomfortable. Does that make sense? And I just simply want you to be aware. You don't have to share anything after, I will ask questions, but you don't have to share. But I just want you to be with it. I'm going to make some comments from time to time. And you can check your head. I guess I can relate. No, I don't relate. Okay? So what I want you to do is to walk around for a moment and just look at each other's eyes. Okay? You can make faces if you want. Like. And so I'm going to ask you to consider some things as you are walking around and looking at each other's eyes. Okay, so can we do that for a moment? And it will take only, I mean, no one had done it. I've been, you know, practicing for 35 years. No one have had a heart attack <laughs> out of this <laughs> exercise. You can actually take a deep breath. Remember, just take a deep breath, it's cool. Oxygen is important for the brain. So as long as you take a deep breath, you will be able to sit back again peacefully later, okay? So let's, let's walk around and just, Maybe just look at each other's eyes. And fall in love if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, look how beautiful those eyes are. And just pick a, par pick a partner for a moment. Well, we can go. <laughs> what, I want you to do is, what I want you to do, don't look at me, I don't even exist. Just, just be with your partner over here, the three of you. Um, take a deep breath and take two steps forward. And this is where you start asking your mind, like, oh gosh, I didn't brush my hair. I have a pimple. Just any thoughts that are going through your head, I just want you to be an observer. No judgment, no. I simply want you to be an observer. Take a deep breath, and take another step forward. And what I want you to do as you do this is just observe what thoughts are going through your head and what sensations are going through your body. Do you want to run? Is that, you know, is, is there a feeling like, oh my God, so this is the wrong workshop? <clears throat> or, or there's a judgment like, oh my God, I have a pimple. I ate lunch. I was supposed to brush my teeth. Whatever judgment of yourself or any judgment at all, just be aware of that. What happens when I feel uncomfortable? Do I turn to run, or do I tend to be present and address the discomfort? Close your eyes for a moment. And just look at how different may that be. Now that I'm not looking, I'm, I'm keeping the same distance, but somehow I've been blinded. Does it feel the same level of discomfort, if you're at the same level of comfort, is there a difference? Am I still thinking about my pimple? 
Take a deep breath. Open your eyes. And take one step back. And simply notice how large that step was in relationship to the three steps that you took forward. <laughs> Are you more distanced now than where you started from? And what exactly that means? Is it about running away from intimacy? Or is it this cultural driven boundaries that we have taken as the truth? And therefore we make the assumptions again that this is how we should behave. Now go around, just maybe pick another person that you haven't been with for a moment. Just change the routine, just be another person. You can, yeah? Yeah, you can go there again. Okay. Now again, take three steps forward. And just notice how those steps are probably penguin steps. <clears throat> and look at each other's eyes and just be with each other. And any discomfort that may come, just be with it. As long as you take a deep breath, I'm not concerned. If you stop taking a deep breath and you start going, <clears throat> holding your breath for so long can be dangerous. So take a deep breath. Good. You're doing beautifully. You're doing beautifully. Now take another deep breath and another step forward. And this is where your mind goes, oh shoot. What am I doing? <clears throat> Just be with yourself. Look at your partner, fall in love if you need to. Oh my God, look how beautiful this woman is. Look at yourself in front of this other woman and celebrate womanhood for a moment. Get your breath, close your eyes. Just be in the moment. Can I be present to this moment? Or perhaps a present with, the, with discomfort. No need to run. Simply surrender without withdrawing. Surrender into the moment without withdrawing. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Another deep breath, open your eyes and take a step back. <clears throat> and again, just notice how large the steps were, that one step was in relationship to the three, four steps that you took forward, non judgment. It's simply an observation. You can go back into your shape. <clears throat> how was that? Only one would like to share. And you could go, no? Yes, remember I said you didn't have to. So I will honor that. So, but I also said that I was going to ask. How was that? Anyone would like to share? I felt that I was more tense when I was in the, I felt that I was invading the personal space. Mm -hmm. And so I tensed up. But I also feel that it's within our culture to keep distance from one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you were evading the dominant culture. Mm -hmm. Well, let me put it this way. It, would, it felt uncomfortable that you were not evading dominant culture. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Anything else? I felt uncomfortable when I could tell my partner was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm worried for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what exactly do you feel that is? That you were able to sense, was she really uncomfortable or was it my own uncomfortability being interpreted as my partner's uncomfortability? I like to think that I felt what they were doing. Okay, so empathic? Okay, that sounds good. And who knows, no? Who knows? Okay. Yeah, I, I felt tense, like what I um, shared before, um, just kind of finding a place to look, one, because being That's three. three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but um, it was amazing even just closing your eyes, being that close, the shift in in posture and just feeling, not feeling as hot, and uh, maybe it's just me that feels hot, but um, you know, not less tense um, in that moment, um, being able to focus on, you know, where I am. Mm -hmm. So think about this in terms of when we ask clients heavy duty questions. Think about that, in, I mean, because this was for us to relate tendencies, possibilities, no? Possibility, what happens when we feel tense? Do we tend to be present? Very difficult, huh? 
So what happened with our, when our clients are not given the opportunity to know that that question is coming? You know? That uncomfortable, heavy duty bomb. Question that is filled with the need for intimate um, information to be revealed. So that's why this, I mean, the exercise was simply for that. Remember, when you are, when we are assessing the client, client is assessing us. And so we do have the responsibility as we are the one creating the structure to alleviate or perhaps attempt to prevent clients from feeling so uncomfortable that the client is not able to be truthful. Tr trust issues. And it's not because of the client that's in trust, but because the client is cautious. How many of you have, think about this for a moment, just to change, um, you know, to change scenario for a moment? I'm sure that um, many of us have experienced this relationship. No? Yeah, yeah. We have enough relationship, relationship with the dog, relationship with water, relationship with food, relationship with other people. No? and <clears throat> and when they have been painful relationship. The painful relationship has ended. You know, so imagine a client going through services, and those services um, didn't create a good experience. No, created some discomfort. Oftentimes, when we come into another experience, we have a tendency to not necessarily trust right away. So, how many of you have heard that notion that you have to earn my trust? Which simply that means when translated into English. That simply means I have been hurt and you are going to pay the consequences. Can you relate to that? So when we are actually telling a client, when, when, when we are actually telling another relationship, you have to earn my trust. If we translate that to real <clears throat> simple terminology, we basically are saying to that new relationship, you <clears throat> have to earn my trust. That simply means I have been hurt and you will be paying the consequences. The same thing or similar thing happens with clients. When clients come to us, we know the first people. So no, no wonder the importance of, again, as we were talking about before, how do we create comfort or participate in creating comfort? In order to participate in creating conflict, I have to self-regulate, meaning self-assess, self-understand where I am. So breathing becomes important. How am I calming myself down so that I can be more present and I can be trusting process? So I find that breathing for me is important when those situations happen, that there's a conflict, followed by questions. Can we create some norm, um, rules, norms, just so let's maybe, maybe listen to each other? Perhaps that should be done in the beginning. You know, we might be, we, through this conversation, get some information that may be so you know, difficult and that may create people to react. So let's be conscious of that. If that happened, let's take a deep breath and bring it back. That is all part of co being culturally sensitive to process, to emotions that may be generated through an assessment process. Rather than being mechanical and asking questions and assuming that the response is the final answer. You know, that's a game, final answer. And a lot of times, I don't know if you just have seen that game, is the wrong answer. Sometimes it's the correct answer. So, um, <clears throat> This is some of the reason research shows some of the reasons why people um, um, resist services. Lack of clarity, <clears throat> lack of trust, uh, fear of the unknown, preconceived ideas, feeling toward authority, um, <clears throat> clients' feelings of powerlessness. So think about different cultures in terms of different cultures that we can and provide services to. A lot of times, <clears throat> many cultures have experienced a degree of misunderstanding 
that allow for them to have that, that notion of, you have to earn my trust. And so imagine if we don't have that understanding to begin with, that those previous experiences may be the ones that are affecting how much this family, within the context of this culture, as we defined previously, system of meaning, how come this client seems to be resisting? How come this client seems to be rejecting? How come this client seems to be withdrawing? Oftentimes, it's not that we go by the assumption, but we could ask questions. Have you had experiences before with other services? So oftentimes, what I do is I try to search th three things. Previous experiences, fears related to those previous experiences that may be impacting, hopes, what this family is expecting now, and expectations. So fears, hope, and expectations. This is to set up the <clears throat> conversation before we even engage. Um, we were talking about um, <clears throat> the importance of us recognizing what is the role that we play within the context of this, this session. There's a theory that is called self-regulation theory. I don't know if you have been exposed to self-regulation theory. But self-regulation theory basically is the theory that helps us recognize, or at least try to make a commitment, <clears throat> to be conscious when we are attempting to managing our thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. And the reason why it's important is because oftentimes when we are not aware of our thoughts, feelings, so, um, <clears throat> and behavior, we tend to be important. We we tend to have impulses, ask questions just because we feel nervous, ask two questions because the client has that response, create more conversation because we are, we don't know what to do with silence. And sometimes silence is part of not just a culture, but personality, people who are introvert. That's important. So self-regulation theory emphasizes the importance of how do we work on ourselves to become more conscious as to how we show up within the context of our professional encounters and personal encounters. Within this context, we're using it for professional encounter. So there's, this is the aspect of um, self-regulation theory. What, what do I want to be, how do I want to behave? If I know that something is not working, I tend to, to react when I'm nervous. I tend to ask more questions when there's silence. I tend to ask double questions when they haven't even responded to the first one. So, if I, so the, the first aspect of self-regulation is just identify what is the behavior that I want to change. What is the thought that I want to address? What is the feelings that I want to confront? So how do I want to behave? How do I want to feel? How do I want to engage in understanding and processing of my, my thoughts? What is the motivation behind it? Well, I want to be more impact, impactful, effective. I want to be more sensitive. So what is the reason behind this, motive, this change? Um, <clears throat> how would I go about evaluating the change of that behavior feeling, thought process, and what will may prevent me from engaging, um, practicing that which I want to practice. So, so those are the questions that we might ask, and then this is the actual practice over here. How do we, how do we, uh, how do I engage in self-reflection? Well, research shows that first we have to observe and identify. Remember when I said to you, what are some of the feelings that you are feeling when you were close? Um, what are some of the sensations in the body? So, and this can be done through so many different ways, self-reflection exercises. Uh, this can be done through meditation in terms of taking yourself through a journey in terms of how do I tend to show up in my relationship, whether personal or professionally. Within this case, we're looking at professionally. How do I tend to introduce myself to client? How do I tend to respond when I know that 
there's a difference between cultural experiences. How do I tend to stereotypes, stereotype, assume when we share a similarity? Because um, many of the research also shows that just because we share similarity doesn't mean that that guarantee effectiveness. It's simply we share similarities. We are women. And so, but there's a diversity within being women. There's a diversity within being Latino. There's a diversity within sharing similar sexual orientation. There's a diversity within sharing similar religious conviction. Um, <clears throat> so observing, identifying, basically what seems to be what is not working or want to change. <coughs> And how many of you have heard the term or the, the concept of the difference between cultural influence and cultural choice? No? Okay. So cultural influence is something that, you know, oftentimes we, we were not able to escape. You know, we were little kids and we were introduced to beliefs and values, as we were talking about before, no? Traditional. Now, after a while, we tend to grow up and we tend to be exposed to other influences, other beliefs, other values. That is where the intersectionality, what we call intersectionality between cultural influence and cultural choice. Now we oftentimes make choices as to this state, I like this about my culture, this changes. I mean, if you think about you know, the cultural of gender, traditional cultural of gender, you know, as women, <clears throat> what were you taught about being women? Uh, women are what? Nurturers. Like we were saying, nurturing, or whatever. And I just said, oh yeah, that's a good part of me, but I'm not to be submissive. I, I need to have a relationship in which we negotiate, not in which I obey, kind of a thing. So that is cultural choice. It's creating choices that leads to beliefs, that leads to tradition, that leads to values, knowledge, learned practices. Can you see that? And so that's what this means over here in terms of you observe and you identify what is that that no longer serve and what is that which I want to, what is the goal? So this is exploring options. What if, you know, how do I want to behave within the context of clients that I may not share the same cultural background. What is the effect of those options? If I don't learn and I continue to engage in this notion that I know, because we all have a way of knowing. Remember the first premise? Um, every experience that I have is interpreted based on my previous experiences. No? Information, new information, new encounters, new occurrences are oftentimes interpreted by the point of reference that I have developed. So this is the self-regulation that goes, con that is connected to culturally sensitive. Remember the part of identifying my implicit biases, what is working, what is not, in order to be culturally humble. Um, questions coming, I feel like I'm, I'm speaking so quick because I've seen the time um, <clears throat> and I don't want to take more time than what, what is required right now. Sorry. Um, so observe, identify, explore options and effect, develop a plan. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I often um, um, share when I'm teaching um, at the university is that I often tell my students, develop a plan <coughs> Excuse me for self-care. Um, how do you take care of yourself is important for how you show up at work. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're constantly going to be tired. You constantly will be in a position in which perhaps you're not doing your best. Um, so <coughs> Developing a plan to developing a plan in terms of how to implement, you know, that which you want to change is important because the plan needs to discipline. How many of you have November 
no, December 30th, said to yourself, I'm going to start the gym tomorrow. No? And what happens? Tomorrow, you know, January 1st comes, and you go to the gym. And then you probably go to the gym for a few weeks, and then you go, I'm going to take a break. And that break, um, <clears throat> uh, the next time that you remember that you have to go back to the gym is December 31st. <laughs> no? So we do know that discipline, <clears throat> we, we, we do function through patterns. And dif uh, a discipline is important for navigating, for supporting, for modifying the patterns through which we engage, for, for changing, for transforming. One thing that we do know, um, <clears throat> and I'm going to deal with that, is we know that there's a difference between change and transformation. Change is constant and inevitable. Transformation is an optional. It requires intentionality, and it requires a degree of awareness. So that's why, you know, when we look at how do we best serve our families, we need to understand that, you know, one way, not the way, but one way is by being culturally sensitive and developing strategies, and we have just touched them today. Um, developing strategies, like how do we ask questions, solicitation questions, how do we ask clarification questions so we're not assuming understanding, how do we ask self-reflection questions, and how do we ask solution questions. But that is just only half of the equation. The other part is how present I am. Can I understand my own biases, and how what I do affects how what I have learned and integrated affect how I perform. Remember that first premise? Everywhere we go, there we are. Thank you.